Thank you very much. That's a, that's a real pleasure to be presented as a political animal and both as a zoologist. <laughs> so, uh, but because we are in the United States, I have to certify that I am in good physical health <laughs> and I am physically able to participate in this debate. <laughs> and please, everybody, raise your hand whether you are in the same good stage in which I am. So please do it. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Because I want to make a small introduction to the booklet you have on the front of you. And uh, that's, to some extent, about a relatively dangerous and complicated issue, which is the freedom. What I wrote in operating instructions in the very beginning, that when it is possible to sentence a person for owning a book such as this one, differences in skin color, clothing, and uniform recede into background instantly. But this little book, which you are presently holding in your hand, if used incorrectly, may bring a different kind of danger. It does not provide the latest easy receipt for solving the most difficult human questions, one of which is freedom. Tyrants, of course, think that individuals like yourself always have too much of it. Still, freedom is like the oxygen in the air, taking too much and you go into shock. It starts to act like a drug. And at the end of my operating instructions, I wrote, the transition from captivity to freedom, if we are thinking about everyday freedom, which cannot be bought and cannot be received as a gift, is a truly multidimensional revolution. You need to develop it with your mind and take it into your hands whether you are white, yellow, or black, don't trust the reds, the greens, or the browns. It's not worth using up your life. Fight for true freedom when ordinary freedom will do. So that's the beginning of the story. And now let me introduce you to the history. I made an executive summary in this poster I made out of censorship in 1980. And let me refer it to previous speech about uprising in Soweto, which happened in June 76. So what mean those dates? Here that's Warsaw uprising. It was last national protest against Germans, but focused on Soviets who were coming to captive us. It was one of the most controversial political decisions in Polish life because the city of Warsaw lost a quarter of a million people during 63 days fight. It's still judged in our political thinking as a very criticized political decision. For some of us, a big mistake but parallelly a heroic part of our contemporary history. And because I am relatively old, and my mom is close to 100 years, she's after her 99, so I'm covering by myself everything what happened between after the First World War. So after it was 56, it was a certain movement in all Central and Eastern Europe after the death of Stalin. 68, in which I was arrested the first time with nice guys in flat clothes. And I told them when they put me in a separate room, there were two in flat clothes. And I told them, look, innocent men and two guys without uniforms. That's a situation from Kafka. Which Kafka? Address. <laughs> so. That's how I started. And it was the momentum in which I realized that the best solution is to stay in silence. No buongiorno, no I want to pee, nothing. 
total silence. It's the best method I am advising to everybody. <laughs> In 70, we had a very bloody event on the, on the, uh, in the cities uh, on the Baltic border. So Stettin and Szczecin and Gdansk. Both regional party committee were burned. And that when Wałęsa as a workers leader started because he was participant in one of the strikers committee. 76. It was the beginning of the, um, of the elite, elitist democratic opposition because workers were attacked after strikes. They were arrested. And Polish intelligentsia, intellectuals, set up a workers for, for you no know, committee for defense of workers, which was transformed after one year as the, into a self-defense committee. And within this milieu, uh, free trade union were created, which were the basic, basic factor for, for 1980 Solidarity Revolution. But if you ask me how to refer this fight to previous speech, I can tell you, I went through a battle with red apartheid. Polish flag is red and white. We had a red dictatorship. So we felt, as free people, in oppression of red apartheid. Reds have the Communist Party, they have the posts, privileges, the censorship. So such a poster couldn't be printed as well during the Carnival. Because we call Carnival 16 months of solidarity legal existence. So between the August 1980 and the end of 1981 when martial law was, was uh, martial law started. So uh, I, I, I have to refer this red apartheid to famous Western expression better red than dead. So because we were discussing during the last two days who and how is taking decisions about his own life, I can tell you when I was a student of a high school, someone gave me 1984 by George Orwell for one night. It was illegally, it was not illegally printed, it was printed in the West, in Paris, and I had this book just for one night to see and to understand in what country I'm living. So since I was free in 68 after two months and a half, because they couldn't collect any testimonies against me because I didn't declare nothing. I declared nothing. So I told myself whether communists will win in the world or not. I don't want to be on the side of the winners. So crucial decision is not kind of positive optimist prospect can be very very skeptical and it happened like that with myself so let me go very quickly to the booklet through the history some people ask me to continue my cardiogram i told them i don't want to continue because enough is that this level of national activity is higher I was precisely convinced that solidarity is the beginning of the end of communism. So when I went with a leaflet of my underground alliance for, for independent Poland to, on the front of the, of the gate of Lenin shipyard in Gdansk, I was quite convinced coming back that that's the beginning of the end. Nevertheless, when Poland was coming to the European Union, I designed for Germans such a scheme showing them how were those ups and downs between 78 and 78 when Polish Pope was elected in Rome and round table talks with different events on the way. So when someone told me during this session that four years, our Palestinian colleague, that four years without the violence it's a lot in Palestine. 
I can repeat that we, ha we went through 20 years of nonviolence resistance to get the goal. So it happens when we analyze the history after, it's always simple. What people are taking here on the front of Berlin Wall, which falls down, that's Poland, Hungary, Eastern German, and, and Czech Republic. So what's, what's expressed here? 10 years, 10 months, 10, 10, day, 10, 10 weeks, and 10 days. So this acceleration happened, but after years, we see in Central Europe that those who haven't done their lessons before are in much, much weaker situation building democracy. That's an idea I'm defending since 12 years to transform Palace of Culture into communist memorial, communist memorial museum because we don't need to spend millions of dollars because the monument exists. <laughs> we just have to change it. So my booklet was written after two visits to Cuba. I realized after my 50s that I have to pay a certain tribute to international community who helped Poland a lot. And I, uh, I, I was sent by an institution based in Washington, uh, Institute for Democracy in Eastern Europe, which is co-directed by Irena Lasota, a dissident from 68, and Eric Chenovet, which, who has nothing, I think, I think with Erika Chenovet, but the same name. <laughs> and I was sent twice to Cuba just to feel from the beginning the smell of communism because you know you can know, you can know and understand many things theoretically but to make a step in Havana and suddenly realize that there's a dead rat on the pavement there's a certain existential experience which has a certain value for us or to see how people are tricking in the shops, or how they are taking baths in the ocean. I will show you that afterwards. But what, you see the date, August 23rd. It was a date when two tyrants, Stalin and Hitler, decided to divide Poland and Europe. It's Ribbentrop-Molotov Treaty, and two fathers of this division after the war, so after Yalta happened. So I was educated as a Polish citizen within this atmosphere and within this framework. That's my old poster, which was burned after martial law because it was exposed in an exposition in, in a regional city. It means them, oni. So in black, that's them and us. It was precisely our situation. We were looking for holes in the system with a certain human energy, enlarge those holes and corridors. So the question of freedom is how to build it before the change happens. That's my political family. There is Jerzy Giedroyc, we called him Prince. It was an emigre review in Paris, based in Paris, with a small couple of people who were defending not only European unity, they were defending uh, uh, national sovereignty of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, of Ukraine, of Belarus, and they were preparing our, our uh, our movement to be more open and to understand that only in United Europe we can reunify Germany safely and we can get our own independence with independence of others. And it was my, some people ask me why I'm architect, writer and politician. I'm not politician, I'm political animal. So in <laughs> 
in 79, so before Solidarity happened, I published under a nickname Poleski, under which people recognize me since now in the streets, Wolność w obozie, Freedom in the Camp. It was reprinted in London Survey, and it was a symbolical title, Freedom in the Camp, because I was believing in this time that I'm living in kind of concentration camp in which the balance between terror, oppression, and fear is dissolved, starts to be dismantled. So I realized, I analyzed some daily situations in the way to, to take such a conclusion, to be prepared to free the camp. And the conclusion of my political essay of this Matthew Poleski, I had the same first name as Machi, my nickname, the conclusion was that the camp will be free. What happened? No. Sorry. So that's the prince of our poets, speaking of Herbert. And that's his arm. He was using such a cheap, big ball pen. <laughs> and that's communist blockhouses here, settlement of blockhouses. That's his, one of his famous uh, poems, The Monster of Mr. Cogito. Cogito in Latin, I think, so Mr. Think. The monster of Mr. Cogito has no measurements. It is difficult to describe, escapes definition. It is like an immense depression spread all hour over the country. It can't be pierced with a pen, with an argument or spear. Were it not for its suffocating weight and the death it sends down, one would think it's a hallucination of a sick imagination, but it exists. For certain it exists. So he made, he gave us a certain image of the situation in which we are. And when we are referring to the mission, that's a poem which was a inspiration for my generation. The envoy of Mr. Cogito. You are safe not in order to live. You have little time, you must give testimony. Be courageous when the mind deceives you, be courageous. In the final account, only this is important. And at the end, and not forgive truly, it's not in your power to forgive in the name of those betrayed at dawn. Beware, however, of unnecessary pride. Keep looking at your clown's face in the mirror. Repeat, I was called, weren't there better ones than I? So he gave us the strength to have a certain distance to ourselves. That's the beginning, ironic beginning of martial law in Poland. In the cinema Moscow, Scorsese movie Apocalypse is Now was performed and there were tanks, Polish tanks, on Warsaw streets. So now it's easy to say, Gorbachev appeared, you went to the round table, but we went through bloody street manifestations. And that's precisely the, the, the rationale how I went to Cuba. Anonymously, I was with three authors in my own publishing house. We published The Little Conspirator. And that's a booklet which made a big career in Poland in the 80s. See note from the publisher, The Little Conspirator is a collection of writings by people temporarily at liberty. <laughs> Once you have read the first section of this booklet, which I, I, I wrote, How to Plot. 
Once you have read the first section of this booklet, it is possible that you will not need the advice from the second two parts. <laughs> but once you have read the second sections, you will know the legal reasons why you cannot be prosecuted for reading the third part. <laughs> After the third chapter, however, you will know why it is best to be discreet about the fact that you have even seen this booklet. <laughs> so, how it happened, how we composed this booklet. You know, we published it, we made a big deal. We published it in my own CDN house, 50,000 copies. In other underground publishing initiatives, another 50. So it was a real bestseller of the underground. See contents. How to conspire, a guidebook for both beginners and advanced. <laughs> it was my work. My colleague, Ursula Sikorska, the citizen versus the secret police. The summons, the tensions, searches, interrogation. And the best, which I put again, of our b big singer, as a sociologue, Jan Krzysztof Kellus, I put it integrally into this booklet, the interrogation game. That's a masterpiece. After 30 years, I didn't need to change any and bibliography. <laughs> so why it was so popular? Because in my distribution network, we were dis disseminating some jokes, comparisons. And we, those who came back to us through our distribution, through our contacts with people, we put into the booklet. So when people started to read the booklet, they told them, that's our life. That's what we are doing. That's how we, we see. That's how we see our activity. So here you can see, for instance, some pieces. It was it was uh, published in 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 Canada in New Brunswick University in very good in very good uh, uh, translation. There were some questions yesterday for Ivan whether something is legal or illegal. I can't use, I'm, not, I'm an architect, I'm not a genetic engineer, but I can, I can tell you I, I, I have in genes what's legal, what's illegal. So here, for instance, when you are dealing with the rats, it is impossible to underestimate them, much less define permissive limits of compromise. They know only one rule, the finger and the hand. Give them a finger, and before you know, before you know it, you will lose a hand. Necessarily, conspiracy in Poland is based on the premise that the authorities and their activities are illegal. The communists not only violate treaties of human rights, which they have ratified, the constitution of the Polish People's Republic, which they impose on us, but even their own executive regulations for the police, including, for example, the ban against using truncheons in closed spaces. It was coming from my own, from my own experience, because once they bitten me, taking the clothes up before. OK, so it's a comment made by Michael Kaufman, who was New York Times correspondent in Poland. And he, he wrote a nice book about those years, Mad Dreams, Saving Graces, Poland, a Nation in Conspiracy. Here, a certain linguistical comment. Conspiracy, in Polish language, means something positive. It has no a pejorative meaning. It's just conspiracy for freedom is a neutral word, OK, neutral expression. There are here our books. CDN, made with letters of solidarity logo, it means in Polish to be continued. That's this, that's this abbreviation. So CDN with national flag means what it means. There's a booklet which was issued last time, Patriotic Business. That's a book about our own CDN publishing. And I found a guy who was a sociologue, and he wanted to write a monography of an underground free market enterprise. So we came to him, and he described our work. That's me, but 
30 years ago. Uh, so, for instance, he analyzed our <coughs> printing places, our distribution network, how the enterprise was acting. It was a big firm. It was a firm having stable staff of 150 people and another 100 in outsourcing. So it was a real enterprise. If you can't understand how it could act, I have to refer to my classical definition of the underground from The Little Conspirator. Underground is actually on the surface, but not on this one on which we are pursued. <laughs> so imagine that a guy with my size, and I was always bald, I had a very good peruke, I was walking the day and night in the Warsaw Street. Just I changed completely my milieu. I was never meeting my colleagues from my studies, my classmates, never ever. So I was on another surface. Another definition in The Little Conspirator, you will meet some of them in this booklet, is that the ideal of conspiracy is known. We close ourselves in a dark room and we do nothing. It's the safest way to struggle. We just think about freedom. But that's not the way to set up freedom in any country. So I made two trips to Cuba to see and to understand what is now communism. You see, socialism or death. You see the misery. Sometimes that's a misery of a country which was extremely rich, rich with very large middle class. Of course, it was kind of cas American casino. Nevertheless, when you see how Shoemaker is working in the street, or how, look, how looks public transportation. So to some extent, that's a symbolic picture I took. So you see nature and civil civilization. And there's a beach. So public housing from 30s, made in armed concrete, very solid construction, were in ruins. And in those ruins, on the length of one kilometer, people were taking bath in those rusted rusted steel construction and in those ruins of, uh, pref or, or, of walls or, or prefabricated slabs. So there's, uh, there's a porch, there's the entrance to the building in which every, every inhabitant is combining his, all, his own electricity system. And of course, grandma. And look at the booklet. Look at the booklet. It's a, it's a long tradition in Poland that illegal books, people were reading sometimes in the public transportation, were covered with regime newspapers. So we could recognize who is reading Parisian Cultura because he had a cover of communist regime newspaper. So I used the same trick. So you open the cover. Here, the daily worker. In Spanish edition, that's Grandma. In Russian, that's Pravda. In Polish, it's Tribuna Ludu. Of course, the format is very important. You put it into your pocket. Uh, so you see, that's a Spanish edition, Polish edition. You have recommendation of our leader, Lech Wałęsa, on the cover, which is kind of collage, because, of course, it's not a real, original, genuine part of this, of this newspaper. Uh, you know, of course, the game, how you, in each country, you, you play this game. And because I want to, oh, no, sorry. I want to convince you to have a look on the booklet. I wouldn't summarize it, just I am, I am giving you some instructions. And let me go through the, 
let me go through the through the content. So there's an Aristotle division, of course, the beginning, the middle, and the end. We are before, during, and after the revolution. So I am describing here the first step, the network, carriage, models of struggle, openness and conspiracy, the citizen and the secret police, and so on, so on. So before, during, with different scenarios, this a bit academic discussion about program and organization because there's a, there's a mutual influence of both factors. And what I wrote after my two trips, I wrote this pocket dictionary of freedom. Why? Because I realized that in each country, people not only understand freedom in a different way, but sometimes they have this intellectual matrix or framework to get and to get things done. So, for instance, uh, there's uh, there's uh, vocabulary in which I describe what's it denunciator and agent. Because who is an agent? That's a secret police officer who is sent to our network to manipulate it. And we can treat it, we can treat him after the change, we can turn him, we have to analyze what he, have done, what he has done before, but he was executing one of the oldest profession of the world, a denunciator in our ranks, it's someone else. So there's a difference between a prostitute and a whore. Prostitute, that's a profession. The whore, that's a character. If someone between us... So there are many, many definitions of this kind which are very strict and up to the point. So uh, you have autonomy, democracy, freedom, solidarity, humor. I, I can't discuss it. I am too serious. After you have training. Training is something really, I repeat it, from our book. Let me read two pieces of, uh, from that. So this kind of game, we are introducing the reader to participate in the game, to ask his colleague to to, to to propose some questions and to study our own reactions. So point one, if you don't give me what I'm asking for you, Mr. K, then unfortunately we will need to detain you longer. If you want to go home, please just give me this simple information. Where did you get this book? And at the end, You have in front of you, Mr. K, this pamphlet. What do you think it is? Who wrote it? Why? You are not talking, Mr. K. You were trained to be silent with different methods. There were once instructions about getting up and sitting down, fragment of the legal code with a crooked interpretation, the citizen and the security police. And now this text. Do you know, Mr. K, what is based on? Here is a photocopy that our counter-espionage service got from a CIA section for Freedom Operations Office. Sensitivity training as a tool for strengthening the resistance to brainwashing. Take a look, Mr. K, and compare them. All 22 points are the same, right? So you still want to remain, si remain silent according to these instructions for a spy. And then you have a tyrant's decalogue. And point number 10, you shall hate your neighbor more than you hate yourself. At the end of my journey, I took 
I took part in this march of white ladies. So <laughs> ladies who were wives of political prisoners. And that's it. So I hope you will use this booklet without any danger to your life, but risking what one has to risk when one wants to win. So I have no other advices to you, only a certain preventive, preventive comment. You know, I used to say to my colleagues in my, in my f underground firm that the only thing I can guarantee you is the long sentence. <laughs> but enjoy what you can enjoy. So, risk is coming, is going with the patriotism, but business is business. We have to pay people to do the job properly. So, the real challenge in, in the opposition movement is to be better than people we are struggling with. Because when there's a turn, political turn, and there's a political change, we take responsibility for ourselves. And there's much bigger challenge in many cases than previous, previous <coughs> civil resistance. And that's what we realize in Poland and in Central Europe and all over the world. So the question is not the risk we are taking now, but we are now proposing a certain basis for future activity. And if the lesson is not learned from the beginning, at the end, we see what we see in many countries, not only after Orange Revolution in Ukraine. So the lesson has to be learned before. Otherwise, the victory is the beginning of the defeat. Thank you very much.